بسم الله الحمد لله صلاة وسلام رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome to episode three of Back to the Future Ramadan TV. I'm Catherine Jones, your emotional and spiritual resilience mentor and coach, your host for the TV show today, and also the founder of Back to the Future Academy, where we are all okay. That is our motto, and our job is to make sure that you feel okay, even if you can't see it. That's what emotional and spiritual resilience is all about. Being able to put our trust in Allah, live in this present moment with tawakkul and with the acceptance of the cover of Allah despite all the tests and challenges that we experience in this life. And do that without losing ourselves emotionally, inshallah. So enjoy this episode of Ramadan TV where we're going to share with you lots of golden nuggets on how you can have emotional and spiritual resilience too, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 10 verse 57, O mankind, there has come to you a good advice from your Lord, that is the Quran, and a healing for that disease which is in your hearts. He also says in chapter 17 verse 82, And we send down the Quran which is a healing and a mercy to those who believe. And in chapter 41 verse 44, Say it is for those who believe a guide and a healing. So today we're going to take a verse and we're going to look at that verse from the perspective of our emotional and spiritual well-being, inshallah. Today we're going to look at Surah Al-Taha, Verse 46, fear not, indeed I am with you, I hear and I see. So how does this verse bring us solace in these difficult times? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he can hear and he can see. In other words, everything that's happening right now, every single leaf that's falling, every single seed that's germinating, every single drop of rain that falls, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. So of course he is aware of what's happening, the challenges we're all facing, the hardships we might be having through lockdown. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that he knows and that he is indeed with us, so not to fear what's happening. So I want to share with you why sometimes we get stuck in that fear or why we really don't perhaps feel the solace in those words it's because we've got the thinking that's in the way we've got fearful thinking thinking about what if this what if that what if I get sick what if my parents get sick and die what if my children get sick what if we can't pay the bills? What if my business goes broke? You know, all these what ifs. And those thoughts become a barrier to us actually seeing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, fear not, indeed I am with you. He never goes anywhere. But our minds do, our thinking does, and that's all that is happening. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what we can manage. He will not burden us with more than we can bear. So have solace in those words, inshallah, and realize or appreciate that, inshallah, this too will pass, just as every other test has. May the peace, love, and blessings of Allah be with you in this beautiful month of Ramadan. As the layers of troubled and stuck thinking fall away, what remains is our innate resilience, confidence, patience and inner peace, our fitra. Fitra is an Arabic word that has no exact English equivalent, although it is usually translated as original disposition, natural constitution, or innate nature. The perfect embodiments of fitra 
where the prophets Ibrahim alayhi salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Back to the Fitra Coaching Academy is founded to teach the truth of our psychology of how Allah created us. This is based on what has been named the inside out paradigm, a subtractive psychological paradigm. Subtractive because it takes thinking off your mind, freeing you to have clarity, direction and purpose in alignment with the straight path. So direct your face towards the religion, inclining to truth. Adhere to the fitra of Allah upon which he has created all people. No change should there be in the creation of Allah. That is the correct religion, but most of the people do not know. Chapter 30, verse 30. Just like Newton's moment of clarity about the scientific paradigm of gravity, a man by the name of Sidney Banks had an insight about how our psychology works. This is not a philosophy or theory, it is a scientific truth. It is a very simple concept that has profound and extensive implications. As each individual gains deeper insight into the paradigm, their innate state of emotional well-being emerges effortlessly. This isn't something you apply to your life, implement into your life or repeat until you believe it. It is something that you see deep within because it is already there. There is no building, healing, affirming, doing of any kind because that comes from the assumption that there is something missing, broken or defective. The reality is you are okay. You always have been and you always will be. It's just that you can't see that you are. How do I know this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah does not burden a soul beyond that it can bear in chapter 2, 286. Being patient with the first track of calamity is possible. Do not be angry is possible. Accepting the qadr of Allah is possible. Putting your total trust in Allah is possible. Simply by understanding your emotions, your own psychology. All possible by understanding one simple truth. We are living in the feelings of our thinking in the moment. It is a simple truth with deep, life-changing meaning. It empowers you to take responsibility for your own emotional well-being without the need for anything or anyone outside of you to change in the slightest. That is why it is called the inside-out paradigm. It all comes from inside. Every minute of your life you are experiencing life through your own thinking. Whether you can see that or not, that is the truth. I don't expect you to get that immediately, although you may. The choice is now yours. Do you want to know more? Have I piqued your curiosity? Do you want to live with fearless confidence, total resilience, effortless patience and inner peace? Do you want to live in a state of taqwa, consciousness of Allah at all times? Iman, deep sincere belief in Allah. And Ihsan, living life to the best of your ability? The choice is yours. The three principles, or the inside out paradigm as I call it, was first articulated by Sydney Banks, a ninth grade educated welder born in Scotland, living in British Columbia, Canada, in the early 1970s. I love to share the quotes and the wisdom from Sydney Banks so we can all reflect on the missing link, or that's what he would call it. Sydney Banks said, if we can forgive everyone, regardless of what he or she may have done, we nourish the soul and allow our whole being to feel good. To hold a grudge against anyone is like carrying the devil on your shoulders. It is our willingness to forgive and forget that casts away such a burden and brings light into our hearts, freeing us from many ill feelings against our fellow human beings. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salamu Rasulullah, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.
This is Catherine Jones, emotional and spiritual resilience educator, mentor, and coach, and founder of the Back to the Future Mentoring Academy. With day three of our 19 days of COVID-19 live classes, today we're talking about life, family, work, self, dean, balance. Juggling it all, now you have everyone under your feet. And for most of us who are mums, or even those of us who perhaps aren't mums, but we're carers of others, uh, living with other people and now, you know, not able to escape that living with everyone else like we would in the past, you know, with the variety of things that we have to do in our lives, it might be harder, you know, to find that balance for ourselves, especially, you know, when we're caring for others and having everybody in our care constantly, subhanAllah. So let's take a look at that because maybe today we're going to look at it from a bit of a different perspective, inshallah. So balance. I want us to talk about the concept of balance. Hard under normal circumstances. Balance is something that comes up over and over and over again, regardless of this current test that we have with the virus and with the world shutting down and our lives looking completely differently to what they looked a month ago, subhanAllah, or even just weeks ago. It's just happened so quickly. So we balance is something that comes up a lot. How do I juggle it all? How do I keep all the balls in the air? How can I be a mom, a wife, a daughter, a friend, an employee, if you're an employee, or run a business if you're a businesswoman, or a student to get your studies done? You know, I understand all of that. I'm a mum of five. I run a business from home and I'm also doing a degree at uni this year. And so I understand it's pretty hard to get everything done. And if we're focused on it being balanced, it can get very, very stressful, subhanAllah. So now we've got everyone under our feet. It's even more complicated. I have a nine-year-old. My older one's they're coping pretty well from doing their schooling from home but with my younger one the teachers are sending through work every hour and so there's this constant interruption of um what do i need to do with this what do i need to do with that i don't understand this question and so it, it's an extra additional load on me that I didn't have before and then on top of that everyone's constantly eating creating dishes creating mess and there's not even that quiet time where the house stays on track anymore subhanallah so it's hard it's constant additional work constantly additional things to do that normally you know weren't they, they were there but not to this degree subhanallah now, for those of you who are homeschooling mums, you're probably quite used to this. And, you know, alhamdulillah, you're, you're set up for this situation. But maybe still you find it hard to balance certain things. And so maybe there is something of benefit in what we're about to talk about today. And the, one of the key things that we're finding is there's no time out for ourselves. And I certainly was thinking that last night when... Just because the kids are not going to school, they're, they're thinking like it's school holidays, so they don't need to go to sleep. And so there was a lot of silliness last night and a lot of not going to bed until really, really late. And I needed my time out and my opportunity to get some rest myself, subhanAllah. And that wasn't happening because they didn't want to sleep because they're thinking, well, you know, it's not school tomorrow, but it is because they're actually expected to log in and check in with their teachers first thing in the morning. So mental shifts for everyone. And a lot of distractions from being able to worship Allah. Like we may, maybe we've been used to having our quiet moments with Allah and now they're kind of lost as well. So it's really more difficult. It feels or it appears than it was subhanallah under these circumstances and it's always been difficult so it's just seemed harder so i want us to challenge some of our thinking is there such a thing as balance because we put so much emphasis on having a balance 
And I'm just wondering whether in fact, even thinking about it that way is what is causing us to feel the struggle, feel the pain of not having balance. So is balance real? Is it actually possible to have a balance? So when we think about balance, and if you look at a balance, I should have got a picture of a, of a balance actually. Or So just imagine a, a set of scales or a, a seesaw or something where it's balancing so both sides are even, right? That's what we think about when we think about balance. But is life really like that? And are we actually meant to be concurrently having everything in a balance? I mean, is, is it in fact something that we've created as something that we should be doing? Is it a story of how we've created things should be? And as a result of that, we're now getting really stressed out trying to achieve it. Just want to challenge our thinking a little bit here. Is there, in fact, a different way of looking at this? And that's the purpose of my life today, is let me see if I can help you see it from a different perspective. All right? So let's go back to a couple of hadiths of the Prophet and start there. A time for this and a time for that. There's a couple of hadiths. Um, actually, they came up in the wrong order, but that's okay. Abu Hurairah reported, the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, take up good deeds only as much as you are able, for the best deeds are those done regularly, even if they are, cons they are a few. So this is the first thing I want us to look at is, are we trying to take up too many things? If this is the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was sent to, to show us the best of manners in all of our affairs, right? Agreed? He's telling us to take up good deeds only as much as you are able for the best deeds of those done regularly, even if they are few. So maybe our first problem is maybe we are taking on too much and maybe we're not actually looking at it from what we're capable of or instead looking at it what we think we should be capable of i know for the last year until recently when i've changed my diet and now my knees are so much better that there were so many things i couldn't do my garden got out of control there were lots of jobs around the house that got out of control simply because I've got arthritis in my knees and, and I couldn't actually get back up if I squatted down. So that squatting position, which is quite important for weeding the garden or for cleaning up bottom cupboards or for you know doing certain spring cleaning jobs like underneath things where you really need to be able to squat down, I wasn't able to do it because once I was down, it was too painful to get back up. Now, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I've... Uh, changed my diet and various things and that pain is now gone alhamdulillah my knee still crack like a ratchet there's a click 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 all the way up but alhamdulillah i can do these things now but for a time i had to let go of certain things and honestly it was hard because i would look around at the things and there was no one else seemed to be particularly keen to do them and if they wanted to do them, they wanted me to do them with them. And of course, that wasn't possible. So I had to let go of some of the things I wasn't able to do. And that was one of the key steps. And stick to the things that I could do and try my best to do them well. Now, the next hadith is actually a long hadith. And I'm going to read it to you where and this is the short part of it where the prophet said time should be devoted to the worldly affairs and time should be devoted to prayer because sometimes we feel the struggle between the balance between the dunya and the akira right 
And so this is a hadith by Hanza. May Allah, Allah be, be pleased with him. Where the, um, it was one of, um, he was one of the scribes of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he reported, I met Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. And he said, how are you, O Hanzala? And I said, Hanzala has become a hypocrite. And he said, far removed is Allah from every imperfection. What are you saying? And I said, when we are in the company of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he reminds us of the hellfire in Jannah, we feel as if we're seeing him with our very eyes. And when we're away from the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we attend to our wives, our children, our business, most of these things and things pertaining to this life. Um, the hereafter slips out of our minds. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, said, by Allah, I also experienced the same thing. So Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and I went to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hanzalah has turned hypocrite. Thereupon the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, What has happened to you? And I said, O Messenger of Allah, when we are in your company and are reminded of hellfire and Jannah, we feel as if we are seeing them with our own eyes. But when we go away from you and attend to our wives, children, and business, much of these things go out of our minds. Thereupon the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, By him in whose hand is my life, if your state of mind remains the same as it is in my presence, and you are always busy in remembrance of Allah, the angels will shake hands with you in your beds and in your roads. But Hanzalah, time should be devoted to the worldly affairs and time should be devoted to prayer. And he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said this three times. And this is a Muslim hadith. I, it's from Riyadh Salahin in the chapter of the miscellaneous, miscell, miscellany, miscellan, however you say that, <laughs> subhanAllah. So there's a, quite a few really interesting points from this. And one of our talks in these 19 days that's coming up is going to be about making 24-7 an act of worship. So sometimes we're seeing our worldly affairs as simply being worldly affairs when a shift in our mindset and intention can actually make them an act of worship. But I'm not going to go into that now. I just want to focus on a couple of points from the Hadith here. One is that the Prophet ﷺ basically said to them, yes, of course, if your mind is always with Allah, you know, this is a great thing that the angels, you know, will, will be there of witness to it. But that there is a time for the worldly affairs. There's a time to be devoted to them and a time to be devoted to prayer, to, to the worship of Allah. And again, it's about a time for this and a time for that. And perhaps one of the things that we don't appreciate or that we're trying to push ourselves into is that that's always in a, in a particular balance or it's always even when in fact life doesn't really work like that. There'll be times when we are more focused on our worship and there will be times when we're mo more focused on issues from this daily dunya life. And there'll be times when this doing your life with the right intentions will actually be part of the worship. But the worship I think that we're talking about here is the reading the Quran and doing those extra prayers, fasting extra days, the things that we want to do specifically for the sake of Allah that really are towards the, the Akira. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already blessed us with certain times when these things get extra reward to encourage us in those times, like Ramadan, which is coming up. And again, we're going to be talking about Ramadan rituals later on in our 19 days to see how we can make the most of that because the rituals will be different this year being in isolation and world shutdown, subhanAllah. And there are certain times of the day that we're meant to pray. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mapped it out for us. He's really given us that opportunity or that guideline. 
And the Prophet ﷺ emphasized this three times to let us off the hook, to not get so caught up in this thinking of what we should do or what we shouldn't do. It really actually goes back to thought in the moment and the issue we have with expectations on ourselves or of ourselves that we expect of ourselves perhaps something that is not possible, that we're expecting more of ourselves than perhaps we can manage. And as a result, we perhaps set ourselves up to fail at everything instead of succeeding at a small number of things. Because one of the things I have found is if you let go of expectations and you just start with one thing, it's really interesting how it all starts to go into a flow. Remember we talked about the flow of water yesterday? Every day we're kind of building on what we learned the day before, right? When we put expectations on ourselves, we tend to push ourselves and we're not in flow. It's like that burrow of rocks we're pushing up a hill. Whereas if we put the expectations aside, set our intentions for the sake of Allah and just start one thing, whatever that one thing is, and it might be something we have to do for this dunya life, or it might be something that we're doing for the Akira. But we just need to start one thing. And interestingly, the rest begins to flow. And in the moment that we're doing that one thing, that is the time for that. It's not the time for anything else. So letting go of the thinking around the other things lets us actually show up with ihsan, with excellence, doing that one thing and focus on that one thing, really in connection with Allah, using our wisdom that comes through that connection from Allah instead of this really heady intellectual thinking where we're trying to force ourselves through it. The other problem we can create with our thought is also expectation of others. We can place expectations on other people in the process as well. And that can lead to our frustrations when they don't meet our expectations. Now, as much as the fr we get frustrated when we don't meet our own expectations, imagine how much we might be placing on other people if they're if we're struggling enough to get it right for ourselves, how is it helping if we're having expectations on them while they are got their own battle around their own expectations and their own balance? So expectations or I should have, um, I should, I was going to talk about the word should and I was just going to should myself. Um, it's all about the, this word should. I should achieve this, I should do this, they should do this, everyone should have this balance in life. Let's drop the word should and just go back to the simple thought. What am I meant to be doing right now? And if we're always asking that and appending to that that is pleasing to Allah, it'll put into perspective right now, okay, right now, I've got dishes to do in the kitchen because basically these days there's always dishes to do in the kitchen because there's people home 24 seven creating dishes, right? There's laundry to do. There's other, well, lots of domestic jobs to do. There's chasing up my nine year old shortly to make sure that he is ready online for his class, that he's got his books all there. I've got, Lots of things on my list to do for my business. There's a lot of things people are expecting of me. But right now, in this moment, I'm not thinking about any of that, apart from the fact that I'm thinking about it to list them off for you. Right now, I'm here present in the moment with you because that's what I am doing right now. And in a few minutes, when we're finished here, my job will be something different. And in that moment, it'll be, what am I meant to be doing right now that is pleasing to Allah? So it's about being in this present moment. And it goes back to how we're thinking about it as to whether we have balance. Balance, I believe, is a figment of our mind. If we are 
every day improving on the previous day, every moment doing something to please Allah. And taking time out and resting is also a part of pleasing Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this mind and body that we have to tire, to need rest, to need nourishment, to need recuperation. And so if we are doing that to look after our body and our mind in order to show up in our best form for Allah, then it can be an act of worship as well. So even taking time out for ourself is part of what might be pleasing to Allah in the moment. So sometimes at night I'm not getting enough sleep. Sometimes in the afternoon when I should be working or I should be doing this or I should be doing that, I can tell my, firstly my brain is foggy and secondly, my body isn't feeling very energetic. And I realized, you know what? I need a rest. And I'll set a timer for about half an hour and I'll have a nap. And it's really refreshing. And that is part of the balance. Balance isn't about being able to look at it and go, right now I've got everything balanced like a seesaw or like a set of scales. It's about right now, what is it I'm meant to be doing? And continuing to stay in that state so that everything eventually actually does get done except for dishes and clothes in this house with everybody home because they're just constantly being created right <laughs> dirty dishes and dirty clothes it's a constant right <laughs> so <laughs> if we have an expectation on ourselves that we're going to have no dishes in the sink and no clothes waiting to be washed or ironed or put away or anything I think right now we're having an expectation on ourselves that is only going to cause us harm because it's really not possible actually to keep up right now with everybody home. So let's just work out what we're meant to be doing right now and it's not dishes and clothes all the time, subhanAllah. So thinking about it differently, it's about that, simply about thinking about it differently. I am just one person. There's only so much one person can actually do. I can do so much with my time and my energy. So there's only so much time each of us has. We all have the same amount of time, right? And there's only so much energy each and every one of us has. So what deserves that time and energy the most right in this moment? What should we be spending our time and energy on in this moment? That's pleasing to Allah. Just don't, those words go without saying at the end of those sentences, right? What balls can I put down? You know how the store thing about keeping all the balls in the air? So instead of juggling all the balls and having half of them drop, choose which ones to put down. You know, alhamdulillah for me, many of them got put down for me because of the virus and because a lot of things have stopped happening and I'm actually seriously considering whether I ever pick them back up again because I can now see hang on a minute is that where I'm meant to be spending my time and energy is that the best place for it or was I doing it because I thought I should so mindfully putting balls down is much better than dropping them because we're making a choice. We're thinking about things differently. We're using wisdom in how we're choosing to show up and choosing what works and what doesn't work for us, subhanAllah. So interesting results when you look at it from this perspective. Others start stepping up. When you step back and say, that's it, I can't do everything, it's really interesting how you open a window of opportunity for other people to step up. And we start to realize how in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, we've actually been the reason why people haven't been stepping up because they saw us as quite capable of doing everything so they didn't feel that they needed to, to do, do it. So others start stepping up. The world doesn't end. <laughs> so suddenly it's not like, Oh no, the world has ended because I've 
stopped keeping up with the dishes or the laundry or this or that or the other or all the other shoulds that you have on your list of things that you should do. The world didn't end. In fact, actually, it feels much better. It really feels much better. It feels calmer. I feel in flow. I'm listening to how Allah wants me to show up and where Allah wants me to spend my time and energy. And it's very productive and fruitful and purposeful and invigorating. And interestingly, what's really, I think, the most profound thing about this is by not worrying about having enough time or energy for everything and taking this way of looking at it, suddenly it seems like there is more time and energy and more gets done. Because you know what was taking away all your time and energy? All that heavy thinking about balance and this and that and all the shoulds. That was taking so much energy and so much time away from actually getting things done. How cool is that? It's quite profound, isn't it? SubhanAllah. So now is your time. What are you meant to be doing right now that is pleasing to Allah? Look at life through this window and you will have a natural balance in life. That balance will come naturally. What are you meant to be doing right now that is pleasing to Allah? That's all there is to the balance in life. I'm really keen to hear what your takeaways are from this video. So do make sure you share them because for some, this could be turning this whole topic upside down. It is a different way of looking at it. just an automatic understanding that happens when we understand that our feelings are coming from thought in the moment at all times. That this helps us with, with showing up with neutrality, showing up with kindness, with compassion, with um, offering uh, uh, from a space of um, non-judgment. Uh, you don't need to understand why other people think the way they think in order to let go of your reaction to it. I love the energy and the pretty much instant change, uh, positive change in our lives that come from internalising that realisation. My overall physical experience then changed. You know, I felt happy. I felt, you know, it's like in my body felt good. You know, have a shower. And just, wow, I'm re moving really good. And then, you know, then you're like, oh wow. You look outside. You go, oh wow, the sun is shining. The birds are chirping. Whereas, I don't know. It was all of a sudden like there was a lampshade taken off my head or something. I'm not. I'm not. I don't really know how to to explain it. That I've taken responsibility for my feelings and for the way I interact with others. It, it definitely increased my trust in Allah. Having a intimate relationship with Allah. That was something that I had missed, I think, for the first few years um, of being Muslim. But now, yeah, peacefulness has been the one thing that has helped me with my own self, um, with my, you know, with my husband and my son and my family. It's helped bring that connection back, which, yeah, before, you know, it would have, yeah, I, I don't know what would have happened. It's like seeing the light. It's like seeing, it's like seeing all shades of yourself, like the, even the shadowy parts of yourself that you were never able to acknowledge or realise before. What would they be missing out on if, if they didn't have this understanding? They're missing out on, they're missing out on so much, so much beauty that the world can give, so much love that i'm always okay even if there is chaos around me you know i want for somebody else what i've got for myself you know we should always want for our, our brothers or our sisters what we have for ourselves and that is that inner peace whatever you think your problem is 
<laughs> the inside out paradigm is a game changer. I don't the be all and end all, you know, it's pretty awesome. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam rasulullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Me First Legacy, the 2019 Me First Summit, where we're talking about leaving a legacy. How will you be remembered when they walk away from your grave? What are they going to be saying about you? And today I have an awesome person with me, Kalisha, who uh, we've just been chatting about all these sorts of topics about Muslim women in the world and her focus is working with Muslim women particularly who are really struggling with their identity, um, wondering kind of how they fit into this new world that we live in that's really kind of fa fairly anti-Muslim. And so she's founded the Developing Diamonds, which is a beautiful name, don't you think? You know, <laughs> so really helping sisters become the diamond that they really already are. I, I assume I've got that right, have I, Kalisha, as far as the concept goes? Yeah, alhamdulillah. So welcome, Kalisha. Um, so glad to have you here today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair. Thanks so much for having me as part of the summit and um, looking forward to sharing some interesting discussions, inshallah, today. Inshallah, inshallah. So before we um, launch into, you know, your advice for the sisters, I'd love for you to first share with us kind of your perception around what leaving a legacy is and why you think that's an important thing for us to be thinking about. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. So for me, when I look at our purpose of life as Muslims and we know that, it, you know, the, the cookie cutter answer is, you know, we live to worship Allah SWT, you know, you want to die in a state of belief and you want to meet him on the day of judgment, having fulfilled your purpose. So when I think about leaving a legacy, it's about living according to your purpose and helping others towards doing the same, whether at an individual level or a collective level, we are all responsible for living a life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in through whatever, you know, means or way possible. And, you know, leaving that behind as a legacy for our families, for our community members, for anyone whose lives we've touched. And leaving a legacy doesn't mean leaving something huge. We don't all have to build mosques and schools and these sorts of things. Sometimes a legacy is just a life that you've had um, a, an impact on, someone that you connected with, a kind word that you said, a reminder about Allah or an example that you set in front of a non-Muslim even. All these are different types of ways to leave behind a legacy. And, you know, we want to pass away and meet Allah and, you know, be at our, you know, on our deathbeds and see a, the life, that the life that we lived, that it was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you strive you know you were striving for him in every way that you could with anyone that you met remembering uh you know what your identity was as a believer and what your purpose was as a believer and that that's what you lived according to so you know for me a legacy is not a big thing or a big project it's you know the micro you know the micro level uh efforts that you make uh in in your life so of course we all want to have big legacies but i think the little things add up to becoming a great legacy, subhanAllah. Yeah, subhanAllah. So what do you think gets in the way of us achieving that? What's, why, why are we perhaps, you know, distancing ourselves from that mindset? I think we're in times where, you know, majority of Muslims perhaps, you know, it'd be even, you know, um, as it goes far as saying that the majority of Muslims, we don't even know why we're here. We don't even know our purpose. We don't have a strong sense of identity. We don't know what we stand for. We don't know whose example we're truly supposed to be following and emulating. We are just navigating this path in life, you know, based on the, the you know, our whims and desires or based on where the world is pulling us or where our family is pushing us or where society's expectations, you know, are calling us to. We're just going with the wind. And so when you're caught in that, you know, uh, sandstorm almost or that, that tornado of being pulled everywhere, you can't really centre yourself to know who you are, why you're here and to be able to really go deep and, and think about 
who you are and what you're meant to do and what your your gifts are and what your mission is as an individual, as a Muslim. Um, so that can often get in the way of building a legacy. If you don't know who you are or what you're meant to be doing or what you stand for, how can you navigate a path forward that to point others towards that will leave a legacy? You know, so the most important legacy that we have for ourselves is in just knowing who you are and, you know, being someone that when people look at you, they're reminded of who they are. Mm -hmm. you know, we want to be, you know, as believers, we know that hadith, you're a mirror of your mm -hmm. fellow 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 muslim and you know i like to think of that in a very you know a lot of different creative ways but we should be you know a mirror for each other that when someone sees you they remember their purpose when they see you that other hadith you know the person who when you see them they remind you of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's who we should be to each other like you mm -hmm. know when we say our greeting is assalamu alaikum peace be upon you whose peace allah's peace so if we're wishing Allah's peace on each other all day long when we're greeting each other, how are we forgetting about Allah in the dynamic of our lives when it's part of our every, you know, our every moment saying Bismillah before things and making sure our food's halal. These are all um, ways of worshipping and recognizing Allah, but we're doing it mindlessly. So, you know, feeling lost in your identity, feeling unsure of your purpose um, as, a, as a human being in this worldly existence that's a massive obstacle to being able to leave a legacy. Um, another thing I think that impacts people a lot is just negativity. Negativity, number one, coming from ourselves and what we're saying to ourselves about we can't do, shouldn't do, um, don't have the right to do or are not well equipped enough to do. So all this self-doubt negativity and then the negativity externally of others, of you know, family members or dream killers as we know them. <laughs> Um, or society saying, no, you know, you people are like this or that. And then we just say, okay, we, we stay paralyzed. We put all these limits and barriers up in front of us and say, you know what, it's just safer to just stay where I'm at, struggle on my own and, you know, take one day at a time kind of thing. Don't think too far, you know, into the future in terms of, you know, what could I do moving forward? Because it's just too scary. We've put up too many obstacles in our own minds and, um, given too much weight and power to what others might say or think about us. So there's a lot in the way of leaving a legacy, but what we have before us now is this amazing opportunity to be guided and nurtured towards getting past all those barriers um, through the amazing support that we have within our ummah. You know, we've got amazing sisters like yourself, Catherine, um, and, you know, some amazing role models in the world that all we have to do is seek them out and you know follow their path like you know use them for inspiration and advice and mentorship and coaching um and navigate the way forward if you want to but we have to step into that and almost like get out of our own way to be able mm. to to head into that giving that legacy that's amazing there's so many amazing things that you've covered there and i know sometimes when our our listeners are listening to us speak they think oh yeah but that's for you because you're like some sort of superhuman because you're doing the work you're doing. But the reality is we're just like everybody else and we go through challenges. So have you got a story you can share with the sisters about the challenges you've faced in order, you know, to get to the place where you are now, where you're seeing clearly what your purpose is and living a sort of a purpose driven life? Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. So I've always been involved in, in community work and I've always loved learning and teaching and I've always loved connecting. I've always loved helping people. And I'd done that for over a decade, you know, for, at a volunteer basis in the community. And it reached a point where I'd kind of, um, I suppose I, I felt like I'd, I'd done as much as I could do in my time capacity and in my abilities and it's like I need something else that really challenges me and that really reaches out to the larger, wider ummah because I'd felt a sense of comfort zone and complacency. And, you know, one of the human needs is growth. So I felt like I wasn't growing. And, um, you know, I, I, I made a decision to, to launch my business, which was something that was always, you know, a passion of mine that or like kind of like a stored dream that I'd shelved and said, you know what, community work for now but maybe you can come back to this doing personal development workshops and, you know, um, you know, teaching sisters Islam in the, you know, through the, uh, I guess, Islamically infused personal development 
that's what I was excited and passionate about. I had all these ideas for these workshops and classes and courses I wanted to create, but I had no time to. So when I made the decision, I was like, no, this dream, it's time now, you know, to fulfill this dream. I, it, the way it makes me feel, the way it lights me up, just thinking about it, I need to do this. So I stepped um, forward and, and started, you know, executing, um, launching the business and I guess getting out there and, um, you know, planning what I was going to do and, and what I wanted to talk about and what I wanted to teach. But there was this massive, uh, the obstacle that I had was my own self-doubt. That was a big one. All this stuff I created in my mind that filled me with literally terror, like filled me with terror about what I thought about myself if I did this, as well as what others might think of me if I did it. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I had a coach at the time who gave me deadlines and said, you're going to do it. You've got 24 hours to execute on this task that you've chosen and you're going to do it. And alhamdulillah, like I needed that. that. That just made me say, you know what, bite the bullet. You know what's right. You know it's what you need to do. And alhamdulillah, like I took action. But oh, it was such, it was probably like the hardest decision of my life. And the confusion in that of like, why for us as Muslim women is it such a big deal to step out and do something from yourself for the community or from yourself and being, you know, an independent business owner kind of thing. Like it was such a big deal. Sorry if there's any background noise. That's okay. We, we all have background noises like that. Yeah. So it's just all quite normal. Welcome to, uh, yeah, Muslim mother business life, everyone. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that was like a big, a big uh, challenge and struggle, getting past my own mindset and my own negativity and limiting thoughts and then um, also dealing with the reaction of the community or, you know, mentors and stuff as well. So, subhanAllah, you know, um, that really shook me where I thought there were people who were going to be supportive of me that weren't supportive of me. Mm. Um, I didn't utter one, mashallah, congratulations, I heard you launch your business. It was just totally ignoring it. And up till now, it's a year and a half later and a couple of key people in my life journey have not made one positive remark or one congratulatory remark. Alhamdulillah, you launched a business. May Allah bless your efforts. Um, and it is, it's disheartening, but I have to stay focused on my vision and my mission and, you know, the work that I want to do. So, yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yes, it is challenging. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. And the lack of support is one of the hardest things when we take take ourselves out there and put ourselves out there in a business sense. So for those sisters who aren't necessarily pursuing a business, just to let you know, being a business mum at home, as you can tell from the sounds in the background, it's just challenging because you don't go to work and you sit in an office and you get your work done and then you come back to the family. Um, as Kalisha is trying to deal with things right now and juggling things right now, it's like this. You're in the middle of something. You're focused. You're excited about what you're doing. And then mayhem happens. And then your whole train of thought's gone. And it, you're stuck again. Like, so, but that is what this life is. It's a test, isn't it? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do we think that we'll just say believe and we won't be tested? So, of course, if we're going to step into something, even a business, that's all about pleasing Allah and being in our purpose in this life to do something good for the ummah. We've got to expect that we're going to be tested whether we really mean it. Are we going to stick it out? Are we going to pursue it? And secondly, there's another one that's not going to want to succeed and that's shaitan. And so that shaitan's going to be at play all the way through. So alhamdulillah, whatever it is that, we decide to do and 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 of course when we're talking to because we're talking to a general audience of muslim women from all different backgrounds whether it's homeschooling whether it's just focusing on being the best mum they want to be uh whether it's they've got to focus on the best nutrition for their family whatever it is that is the thing that rings their bells it's just about you know showing up with ihsan you know to try and please Allah in, in the area that's our, our strengths and expecting the challenges, expecting the bumps in the road. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a smooth road. It's a very, very bumpy road and it's an uphill road, you know, like I used to have this dream growing up where I was, cause we used to live out in the country and we had these limestone roads and I used to have this recurring dream of 
um, climbing up a really steep limestone hill. Mm. And my, you know, I was always worried and, and like, okay, I can't fall back. I can't fall back. I have to keep striving moving forward. And I think that was like symbolic of this is what life is about. It's an uphill journey. It's a struggle. Um, but you have to like hold on, you know, and subhanAllah, we're, you know, we're reminded all throughout the Quran that we have to keep striving and we have to remain steadfast and we have to stay, you know, purpose focused all mm. the time. SubhanAllah. So what would you suggest, sisters listening to, to you today, what would you suggest is the best way forward for them? What could they do right now to start being more legacy focused, like more purposeful in, in the way they're approaching life? Yeah, I think it's very important to have that time alone to reflect and to map out where you are, where you want to go, um, to really dig deep and discover who you are and who you want to be and become. Um, and also just to give yourself a bit of like self-love and self-care to really honour who you are, where you are at the moment. And the fact that you want something good for the ummah and yourself and for your family, that that's a beautiful thing. Like that's a commendable thing. And I think we don't, um, we don't, you know, we don't I guess, acknowledge ourselves enough we look for external acknowledgement, we look for validation, but it's like we need to validate ourselves. That is like our passport. That is our ticket to moving forward in life to say, you know what, I am enough. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good person. I'm a good Muslim who wishes well because we are told so much all the time, actions are by intentions. The fact that you have good intentions, whether you live the part outwardly as, as a Muslim or not, the fact you have good intentions and a good heart that loves Allah SWT, you're winning you are like, you know, you're winning because that is what Allah SWT counts, counts the intentions. He counts where your heart's at. He doesn't count what the external results are. So if you, if you are focused on your intentions and the person that you are with Allah SWT, then everything else becomes easy. Everything else becomes doable. Everything else becomes uh, figure outable. You can figure everything out in the path moving forward in your life and in your business. If you can just have, peace of heart, internal, you know, tranquility and, and, you know, to really feel centered in knowing who you are and what you stand for, what you believe in. And, and having that solid base will give you the courage to do what you need to do in order to build and leave behind, you know, an amazing legacy, inshallah. And that amazing legacy that we leave behind, um, the most important one is that we've got a scale that's full of good deeds on the day of judgment that we get our book in our right hand. I mean, that's the, ultimately the legacy, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's what you want to have stockpiles of. And, mm. you know, there is that beautiful narration where, you know, you, you want to be that person who um, comes on the day of judgment and, and is like, where did all these good deeds come from? You know, and it's someone that you helped and it's someone who you cheered up and it's someone um, who saw you know, and advice that you gave or read even a positive post that you wrote and you gave them joy, even just for a moment. Like these are all good deeds that we aren't counting, but the angels are counting it and writing it down. And, you know, it will be presented to Allah SWT and we want to be in shock. Like, subhanAllah, like all these little things. I didn't know they were such a big deal, but they are a big deal. And, you know, the legacy that you can potentially leave behind is in just being you being that well-intended, good-hearted person who's making a difference in every little way that they can. That's so beautiful, isn't it? It makes it so attainable for anyone. Absolutely. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all in awe of our good deeds on the day of judgment. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you have something to offer the sisters that I hope, inshallah, is going to be their beginning of their journey to their legacy moving forward um it really the whole theme of legacy fits so beautifully with the work that you do so can you share with the sisters what you have for them today yeah so i've got a freebie uh, which is my ebook called 10 steps to strengthen your islamic identity um, because you know the islamic focus is my deep passion and my mission and my own individual purpose um, for me i want to direct other sisters towards um, you know, discovering Islam as the ultimate answer, you know, and the ultimate uh, way to navigate through their lives. So 
in my ebook, it covers a lot of different areas that kind of touch on what I teach and what I focus on within my business with the coaching, the workshops and the courses um, that I, that I provide. So reading the ebook will give you some tips to just take away and think, okay, this area I've never thought about. I'm going to work on that to strengthen my identity. Um, And it will also give you a taste of, oh, these are the types of areas that Kalisha can support me in or can advise um, or coach or or mentor you as well. So inshallah, you find it of benefit. Inshallah. I'm sure it will be. And it really brought to my mind that you don't know what you don't know. And so unless they open that book up and see what those 10 points are, there may be something really hopeful there for them, even if they felt like everything has been hopeless until now. Yeah. So yeah. alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. Jazakallah says for your inspiration and yeah. for the work that you do for the ummah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your work a success and be a source of all these amazing good deeds on the day of judgment. Mm-hmm. Sisters, you know, make sure that you click on the link below um, for that ebook and download it and read it. Yeah. Don't put this stuff together for fun. We put it together. It's really light. You could read it in literally five, 10 minutes, you know? So, Mm. and as you can hear now, I've got someone knocking at (laughs) the door. I mean, it's so, this is what life is like working from home. So on that note, I'll say to everyone, Jazakal khair for being here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Each day on Back to the Future Ramadan TV, I want to leave you with a question to reflect on and then I would love you to share in the comments below what you come up with. Today's question is, what do you do to get closer to Allah? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam wa rasulullah. So we've got session three of the worshipper series, which is the golden advice. And like all these classes, you know, there's so many absolute gems in this, subhanallah. So what do you wish for? And that's the question we're going to answer today. Through a character that is dear and beloved to all of us, Aisha said about this character, decorate your gatherings by mentioning him. And Ibn Masud used to say, if so-and-so is mentioned, then he is welcome. In other words, he is welcome to be mentioned in our speech. And this character is someone we will pause and ponder upon. And it's the character of Al-Faruq, Umar Ibn Al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. So Omar has been chosen to introduce the topic for today because it was narrated in so many reports that Omar used to have wishes. He used to have beliefs that we all need to really take into consideration, inshallah. So what did Omar used to think of? What were his wishes? What was his message? What was his goal? Omar used to say, I wish if I was in Jannah, but not only did he wish for Jannah, where I, would, I could see Abu Bakr, he wished for Jannah with the company of Abu Bakr. In a hadith in Bukhari, Umar used to supplicate Allah and say, oh Allah, grant me martyrdom for your sake and a death in the land of your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar used to say, I wish if I could put money in the hands of the widows of Iraq so that they don't need a man after me. His wish was for everyone to live an honourable life and find provision and not be in need. His wish was to meet Allah, a poor man, with no rights for him nor any obligations on him from anyone. Umar had a message. He had a goal. He had a wish. Now, Umar had an intention. And that is our golden rule, our golden advice for today. So you know that the Prophet said actions are based upon intentions. So don't work for free. Don't work for Allah in the path in the path to Allah for free. Don't work without expecting a reward from Allah. 
When you don't aim for Jannah and Allah's pleasure in your intention, you'll be working for free. When you just do what you do without thinking, when you just pray, give charity, when you spend every day like any other day and life just keeps going without having a goal that you live for or an intention in your work, that means that you're working for free. You won't be rewarded. Al-Humaydi mentioned in the book of Jathwatul Muqtabis, excuse the pronunciation, <laughs> regarding the rulers of Angelus, a man called Muhammad ibn Ishaq, who was a pious man known for his good work and obedience and abstinence from the dunya, once advised a minister and said, be sure not to do anything except with an intention because then you will be rewarded for everything you do. If you eat, then intend to do so to be able to worship Allah. And likewise in your sleep and in your entertainment and the rest in the rest of your actions, for you will see the reward of this intention in your scale of good deeds, inshallah. When you eat, have the intention that you're eating in order to be able to obey Allah. When you go to sleep and take some rest, do it with the intention of resting so you can continue on your way to the hereafter, not the way to the dunya. The journey of the hereafter, not the journey of the dunya. When you enjoy some form of entertainment or play, have a certain intention. Intend to make a Muslim, male or female, really happy and tend to make your family feel happy the minister said i have been benefiting from this advice ever since so this was the golden advice to have an intention for every action one time a student of knowledge went around asking the scholars and the day callers to, to Allah a very important and crucial question he asked them who could guide me to an action that I would constantly remain a worker of Allah by doing for I do not like an hour of the day or the night to pass by me except that I am of the workers of Allah he wanted to do something that would continue throughout the 24 hours of the day so what was this action could it be fasting? But fasting only lasts for however many hours from, from dawn to sunset. So what about the remaining hours? We won't be working for Allah in them. What about praying the night prayer? If someone is really serious and stayed from Fajr until Isha, praying in front of Allah, how long would it take him? Eight hours? He still hasn't consumed the whole 24 hours. Giving in charity can only give in charity a certain time, during a certain time, and not be able to do that at other times. So what is it then? What is the action that would continue throughout the whole day? So it was said to him, you have found what you are looking for, meaning we have the answer for you. Do good deeds as much as you are able to and what you don't or are too weak to do, then intend to do them. So what can I do right now? I can reconnect the ties of my kinship. How about you? What can you do? I can go to work and provide for myself because the upper giving hand is better than the lower receiving hand. And you, what can you do? I can treat my family kindly. What about you? So do good as much as you can and whatever you can't do, then have the intention to do it anyway. For example, intend before you go to sleep so that these eight hours of sleep, <laughs> eight hours of sleep, I'd be lucky to get eight hours of sleep, could be obedience to Allah. Have the good intention. Say, oh Allah, I am just taking some rest. So I could wake up before Fajr and pray. Or I'm just taking some rest so I could get up and pray Fajr on time. Have an intention. Say, oh Allah, I will try to have my tongue not stop remembering you, but there will be times when I'll need to talk about such and such or such and such and do such and such. In other words, 
have the intention to always want to have your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah so that when you have to talk about other things, you still get the reward for the intention. So whatever I can't do, I've had the intention of doing it and I'll earn the reward of doing so with my intention. SubhanAllah. So I'm going to tell you a story of one of our scholars. This man said one time, if Allah blesses me with a million pounds, I will spend it to pay the debts of the righteous people in need. He knew that people today were struggling with so many liabilities and had to take debts. So he decided that if Allah ever blesses him with a million pounds, he would do this good deed and pay off the debts for these people. Look at how Allah looks at what's in our hearts. Allah does not look at our images or our bodies, but he looks at our deeds and our hearts. And indeed, this man traveled on a certain journey and he was awarded a prize. And subhanAllah, the prize was one million pounds. As he intended, he was given. And indeed, he did as he said and spent the money on paying the debts of people who couldn't pay their debts. SubhanAllah. So often do we hear the righteous people say, Oh Allah, I wish to die a death of kings. I used to know one of these people who, who did die that death. He died while he was prostrating. He was the imam and in the second raqqa of the Isha prayer on a Friday night, he died in his prostration. This man used to say, Oh Lord, bless me with this to die a death of kings. The death of kings is to die where you are in prostration, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this man what he wished for because of his good intention. And Hajj Mustafa died, Hajji Mustafa died in this prostration just as he wished. SubhanAllah. So it's all about the intention. Human development specialists say that the equation for success is to have three things, knowledge, skill, and motivation. So what does this mean? This means that if you want to succeed, you first have to know where exactly you want to go. You have to have a specific goal that you focus on. And if you want to succeed in anything, then you have to have the required skill because you can't succeed if you lack the skill. And on your way to success, you might go forward for a while, but then find yourself unable to continue. And so you have to have the motivation inside you to go on, to push past that. So where does this motivation come from and how do you acquire it? This motivation comes from an intention, a real intention, a real goal that you live for and live to achieve. This is the difference between a worshipper and a knowledgeable person, a scholar. A knowledgeable person is someone with intentions, someone who knows how to trade with Allah. A worshipper in the correct sense that we don't mean in these classes is someone who just increases his deeds, praying, fasting and charity with no intention. Sorry, having trouble turning my page here. If you want to be like the companions and the salif, this is what you could sum up their character by. What is the difference between us and them? It's not just the amount of their deeds or knowledge. We have things to store knowledge with these days that no one would have dreamed of before. Like we can have a, our phone filled with all the knowledge that, that you need. You could, with the press of a button, make the hadith you're looking for appear in front of you on the screen. The same hadith that they used to look for in millions of books and references. The difference between us and them is intention. This intention is the golden key. It is what transforms our habits into acts of worship. It is what makes our acts of worship worth greater and higher rewards. That's why the Prophet ﷺ used to say, 
Whoever observes fast during the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's rewards, then all his past sins will be forgiven. I believe sincerely that I have to fast and I expect and I hope to be rewarded by Allah to have all my past sins forgiven if I truly fast a sincere and valid fast. SubhanAllah. Whoever establishes prayer during the nights of Ramadan faithfully out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's reward, all his past sins will be forgiven. Whoever establishes the prayers on the night of Qadr, power, out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's rewards, then all his past sins will be forgiven. You'll always find the Prophet وسلم, used to say, out of sincere faith, and hoping to attain Allah's rewards when it came to great deeds like fasting and the night prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you are killed in the cause of Allah for the sake of Allah, while being patient, forbearing and hoping for expecting your reward from Allah and fought facing the enemy, not turning away your back, not running away from them, your sins will be expiated. So the most important thing is hoping for the reward and expecting it from Allah. Sometimes we're afflicted with severe calamity or a serious illness. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha once asked the Prophet sallallahu wasallam in a hadith Bukhari and she told him about plague, that it is a punishment that Allah afflicts upon who he wills. The Prophet ﷺ said, And Allah has made it a mercy for the believers. No one who, when the plague strikes, stays in his country, being patient and hoping and expecting the reward from Allah, knowing that nothing happens to him except that Allah has written it for him, except that he will have the same reward as a martyr. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, that the person who is affected by plague or any of these serious illnesses and has the intention of being patient, expecting his reward from Allah, Allah and dies, he will die as a martyr. SubhanAllah. Also following funerals, whoever goes and prays the funeral prayer, he will have a kurat, a mountain of reward for that. Whoever prays the funeral prayer and then follows the funeral until the burial will have two karats of reward. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever follows the funeral of a Muslim having sincere faith and expecting the reward from Allah, he will be one who accumulates and reaps this reward. SubhanAllah. It's all about expecting your reward. It's all about having an intention. That's why when you look at the deeds of the Salaf and in the companions, you won't find that their deeds were that great in amount or very grand. Yes, of course, many great deeds were reported to be done by them. But when you really look closely at their actions, you'll find that they were hopeful for Allah's reward by nature. For example, Look at this hadith narrated by Muslim and Ibn Majah and considered Sahih in Albani in the book of Sahih al Taghib. From the hadith of Ubay ibn Kab, he said, There was one man from the Ansar who I didn't know anyone to be further away from the mosque as him, and he never missed a single prayer in congregation. So he was told, why don't you buy a donkey and ride when it is dark or when it is hot? At least have a mount so that you don't walk all this distance in intense heat or when it's dark. And the man said, I would not like my house to be next to the mosque. I want to be rewarded for my walk to the mosque and my return to my family. Every single step I take will raise me up a level with Allah and erase a sin from me and multiply my credit of good deeds. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has granted all that for you. He has rewarded you with all that. And in another narration, he ﷺ said, you have what you expected or hoped for. Yes, he was a man who hoped for the reward, a man with an intention, a man with a goal he lived for. He was a man who thought of the hereafter, a man who wanted to increase 
his good deeds and he got what he hoped for. It is all about the intentions because whoever lives for something usually dies upon it and he is resurrected upon it. Take this law and never forget it. Whoever lives for something will die upon it and whoever dies upon something will be resurrected upon it. This intention is a very serious thing. Sometimes a person isn't able to do a certain deed, but through his intention, he could be rewarded just as he could have been if he did the deed, if he truly was sincere. The Prophet ﷺ once said, there are people back in Medina, there are people sitting in their homes in Medina and not participating with us in jihad because they are excused, sick, poor, unable. We don't cross a valley or a deep land except that they are with us, except that they will be rewarded just like us. They were excused from fighting, so they were rewarded for their intention. See what intention can do? SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ said it was narrated by Al-Bayhaqi and considered Sahih by Albani. Indeed, when Allah Azawajal inflicts his torment on the people he hates and it finds the lives of a righteous people and they're destroyed by their disobedient people's destruction they will then be resurrected according to their intentions and their actions and deeds so when the world is filled with so much evil and corruption and everyone is clueless and heedless of Allah, committing sins that cause the punishment of Allah to be poured down on them, and the punishment of Allah then comes down on earth and takes the righteous along with the corrupt, each will be risen and resurrected and judged according to their own intention and deeds. Intentions will be what saves the righteous among them. SubhanAllah. So it's a good thing to remember when when you see um I, I remember this being coming up when we had the first tsunami in Indonesia. Um and you remember uh, Indonesia and Thailand and um all, all that area, there was a big tsunami and it washed out everybody. And there was a lot of corruption there, but in the areas where it was washed out, but there were also a lot of true believers. And I remember someone talking about this and saying that, that those that were true believers amongst them will be, will be resurrected upon what they died upon. SubhanAllah. So this is why it's so important for us to be focusing on our intentions so that when we die, we die upon the state that we're in. SubhanAllah. When one of us hopes and expects the reward from the Lord of the heavens and the earth, if we are really people of intentions, people with goals, this will raise our status and level in the eyes of our Lord. The Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, you will not do any action seeking the face of Allah solely for Allah's sake, except that you will increase a level and are raised up by it. Hoping for the reward of Allah is what raises a servant in the eyes of his Lord. True and sincere expectation and hope for the Allah's reward will grant you the reward of the deed if you are excused from doing it. The Prophet ﷺ said in a Hadith Bukhari, if a servant gets sick or travels, the rewards for what he used to do when he was healthy or resident, not traveling, will be written for him. So imagine if you had the daily routine of praying tahajjud, praying all the sunnah prayers, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, you know, all these things that give you great reward, inshallah. And then you fall ill and you're no longer able to perform those deeds because you're not strong enough or whatever, you can continue to earn the reward from them. SubhanAllah. And so the Salaf decided to establish a whole science and call it the science of intentions. 
Yahya ibn Abi Kathir used to say, learn how to have the intentions for it is more important than the action itself. And Suf Sufian al Thawri used to say, they used to learn how to have the intention for an action as you learn how to do the action. That's how seriously they took the intention, subhanAllah. And just imagine how much we spend our time on autopilot, subhanAllah. Look for how far our intentions can take us. The Prophet ﷺ said, this dunya is for, consists of four individuals. A servant whom Allah blessed with money and knowledge, so he fears his Lord and connects between the ties of his kinship and regards the rights of Allah in it as in his money. He is in the highest position, a servant whom Allah blessed with knowledge, but not with money. And he is sincere in his intention and says, if I had money, I would have done like what so-and-so does. So he, with his intention, is the same as the other one. SubhanAllah. This is good news for those of us who don't have money, right? SubhanAllah. We can have the reward of the one who is out there spending massive amounts of money in charity, supporting the people who, who are in desperate need. Simply by having the intention that if we had the money, we would have done just like them. SubhanAllah. And we complain when we don't have it because we can't give in charity when all we need to do is make the intention that if we did, we would. So he, with his intention, is the same as the other one, subhanAllah. Look how this man's intention raised him in level and equaled him with the one who had both the money and knowledge, subhanAllah. Then the Prophet ﷺ continues to tell us about the other two individuals, a servant whom Allah blessed with money but not with knowledge. So he spends his money foolishly without knowledge and does not fear Allah. He spends his money in non-permissible things to satisfy his desires and does not connect the ties of kinship through his money, nor does he regard the rights of Allah with it. And he, this individual, is in the lowest position. Then there's another one who has no knowledge or money but wishes if he could do the same sins that his previous man does. If only I had the money, I would have done this and that like him. The Prophet ﷺ said, so with his intention, they are the same in sin. SubhanAllah. That's a bit scary too. <laughs> scary indeed, SubhanAllah. Yes, it's all about the intention. Now let's learn a few deeds which can earn us great rewards if we hope and expect to be rewarded by Allah. And don't forget that part of the intention that we're doing it to be rewarded by Allah. Sometimes we are saying, I do it for the sake of Allah, and we're not thinking about the fact that we're specifically seeking Allah's reward. Now let's learn about these deeds. Do you know that when you go to pray any obligatory prayer in the mosque, if you have the right intention, you could earn the reward of going to Hajj, to pilgrimage? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever comes to an obligatory prayer, then his reward is the same of that of a Hajj pilgrim. And whoever comes to a Nafila prayer, voluntary Sunnah prayer, for example, if you pray the Duha prayer in the mosque, or pray the Tarawi prayer at night, then he will get the reward of an Umrah, a minor pilgrimage. SubhanAllah. I could have a wish to be one of the most rewarded people by Allah. I could have a wish to go to Hajj, but I might not have the means. By Allah, with your intentions, you may have the reward just as if you were among the pilgrims. SubhanAllah. Oh Allah, our excuses have prevented us, so do not deprive I provide that. Yeah deprive that's the word deprive us of the reward of hajj subhanallah a lot of people say i know that the prophet sallallahu said that whoever does not have thoughts of going for jihad for the sake of allah and dies he will have died on a portion of the portion of hypocrisy but i can't go for jihad for the sake of allah what should i do I tell you, with your intention, you could do the, be the same as a fighter for the sake of Allah. Oh Allah, our excuses have prevented us, so do not 
deprive us the reward. Oh Lord, I wish I could be one of the soldiers of your soldiers, but I don't have the ability. With your intention, you can acquire the reward. You could go to sleep and say, oh Lord, bless me with the night prayers tonight. Make me wake up to pray the night prayer. But you don't wake up and you sleep because Allah could have just given you the charity of letting you sleep. And because of your intention, your sleep then becomes the same as praying for the sake of Allah. Just to have a sincere intention with Allah to subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, it has to be in sincere intention. You don't go to sleep, not set the alarm because you don't really have the intention of getting up and going, oh Allah, I'm going to have this intention so that I can sleep tonight and still get the reward. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> SubhanAllah, you have to genuinely have made the intention, I want to get up, but then somehow you miss it. SubhanAllah. Do you know that you could intend to pray the normal prayers that you pray in the mosque, the prayers that are multiplied by 27 times? You could wish that you could pray these prayers in the haram, but you don't have the means to stay in Mecca. By Allah, with your intentions, your prayer could be worth 100,000 prayers, just as if you were praying in the haram, if you really are excused and can't go there. Oh Allah, our excuses have prevented us, so do not deprive us the reward. So, for instance, a, a sister who has no means, maybe no mahram to travel with or no means financially, or someone who is sick and not able to travel and never has that opportunity, could still get the reward through their intention, subhanAllah. When you enter the mosque, have the intention to make itikaf seclusion. This intention of itikaf will keep you away from the fire the distance of three trenches. If you say in your heart as you walk into the mosque, I intend to make itikaf, you will earn the reward. For the sisters who don't have to go to congregational prayers or Friday prayers, with your intention, if you pray by the side of your bed, in your bedroom, as the Prophet ﷺ advised, your prayer will be greater than the prayers in the Prophet's mosque. SubhanAllah, where one prayer is worth a thousand prayers. SubhanAllah. Talk about making it easy on us. SubhanAllah. We want to be, we want to have these intentions. We want to understand these concepts. If you want to go into your kitchen, have the intention of feeding your family or feeding those who are fasting. Every moment that passes us, we can transform into worship through this golden advice through this intention we want to earn the rewards of deeds by having the intention to do them we want to intend to do all that is good while you are sitting like this say oh lord bless me with such and such a provision and i'll do such and such with it having good intention just like Hajj mustafa had allah gave him the money so he could put his intention to work we want to want the, to be people of intentions. We want to go by this golden advice and transform all our actions into obedience to the most compassionate and apply the meaning of the verse, say, indeed, my prayer, my rites of sacrifice, my living and my dying are for Allah, Lord of the world. Surat Al-An'am, verse 162. We never want to forget this golden advice because it will be the key to every class of the worshippers series. Don't forget, we return, repent, worship and praise our Lord. And I ask Allah to accept from me and from you and take our hands towards him as he would take his honourable servants. And you will remember what I now say to you and I entrust my affairs to Allah. Indeed, Allah is the seer of his servants in Surah al -Ghafir. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad and upon his family and companions. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Ramadan TV from Back to the Fitra Academy. Don't forget to check out our Peaceful Hearts program. You'll find it at heartsfindrest.com. It's an amazing program that will take you 
to understanding the inside out paradigm from an Islamic perspective so you can have emotional and spiritual resilience and well-being inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.